his own intelligence community. And who knows who he's listening to? Probably Fox and Friends or Vladimir Putin or some other source of information. And the fact is that he is not acting on the best information available. Now, I had a little bit of hope this morning seeing some of the earlier tweets where he was implicitly conceding that, yes, Kim Jong-un has not actually denuclearized. ISIS has not actually been defeated. So I thought, hallelujah, welcome to the world of rationality. This is finally something fact-based in President Trump's Twitter feed. But of course, then a few minutes later, he had to go and blow it by attacking the intelligence community assessment that Iran is not actually at the moment developing nuclear weapons. And what he wrote was that the intelligence people seem to be extremely passive and naive. And I just had to laugh at that. This is from a president who has said that he is in love with Kim Jong-un, one of the world's most vicious dictators, and who has taken the word of Vladimir Putin that he did not hack the Democratic Party in 2016. So this is the president who's accusing the intelligence community of being passive and naive. I mean, that's, that's a joke. The president is really living in this alternative universe where he believes what he wants to believe, and he doesn't care about the facts. Here's the thing. Uh, these decisions are not just tweets. They're affecting, they're making policy, yeah. right? The president's view of ISIS in Syria yes. has led him to withdraw troops from Syria. Right. Barbara, I wonder, because Mitch McConnell, this is very unusual for him, is publicly uh, disagreeing with the president on Syria, saying the U.S. troops need to stay there. From your perch at the Pentagon, is there any sign that that withdrawal of troops is changing at this point? Well, I think it is fair to say the Pentagon would like to take a uh, more nuanced approach, a more analytical approach. Basically, you know, it's not so simple as slow it down, but they want mm. to take this piece by piece and do everything they can to minimize risk. Because I think that one of the common threads we're going to see in all of these scenarios, in all of these geographic areas, as the president of the United States, States makes foreign policy and security policy by tweet, America's adversaries watch that and they calculate their next moves. And right now, ISIS, the Taliban, the Iranians, are, the Syrians, are they calculating, the North Koreans, are they calculating that maybe all they have to do is wait Trump out? He seems pretty amenable to all of them. Maybe they just yeah. wait him out. It's a real yeah. concern. Yep, no question. Uh, and based on experience, right, the tweets seem to try policy more than Mitch McConnell or the intelligence agencies. Barbara Starr, Max Boot, thanks very much. Also this morning, more than 200 million people across the U.S., that's a lot of Americans, about two-thirds, <laughs> are facing freezing temperatures. In Chicago, more than 24 hours straight of sub-zero temperatures. We're talking about instant frostbite in large areas of the Midwest, and even my colleague here from Minnesota is saying <laughs> this is cold. I mean, when New Yorkers tell me it's cold, I tell them it is negative 66, folks. That's what it feels like this morning in Minnesota. In Michigan, state offices are closed. North Dakota has a message for residents. Stay off the roads. Our Ryan Young is in Chicago. Ryan, I have been there on these assignments. Thank you for doing this, my friend. Tell us what it's like. <laughs> Uh, you know, at this point, I think my IFE is starting to blow out my ear, but you know, there's those days you question how much you love your job. I absolutely love my job at this point, but you have to talk about just how cold it is. You can feel it in your lungs, your toes, or your feet. My photographer's hands are almost rock solid because he's been holding his camera all morning long. But as we talk about just how cold it is, this is, we're talking about some deadly potential temperatures here. Look out at the river. This is the iconic Chicago River. It is frozen over. And then you, when you look at the big Lake Michigan, I think we have that shot up as well. You can just see the steam rising from this. All morning long, people, as, as they've been walking by, I said, they never experienced temperatures like this. When you feel it on your skin, it feels like needles hitting the front of your face. Nearly three quarters of the U.S. bracing for bitter cold. Like I'm going into a freezer. Digging out. As life-threatening low temperatures and ferocious winds grip the Midwest. It's hard to take a breath in. It's affecting my lungs a little bit. In Wisconsin, a 55-year-old man found frozen in his garage after authorities say he apparently collapsed while shoveling snow. Slippery roads making travel a nightmare. This dash cam video capturing the treacherous driving conditions in Minnesota, where police say 193 crashes were reported on Tuesday. The wind chill at the Benton, Minnesota airport clocking in at 62 degrees below zero. It's really, really dangerous out right now.
This 13 vehicle pileup in Michigan, bringing the highway to a standstill for hours. Slow down and leave space between you and the vehicle in front of you and be prepared for whiteout conditions. In Illinois, giant patches of ice blanketing the Chicago River. Residents insisting they're ready for the deep freeze. I'm dressed in layers, so I have two pairs of pants on. But as long as I bundle up, have a hat, have a coat, I think I'll be fine. Dangerously cold air predicted to make temperatures here feel like 50 below. These conditions are and can be life-threatening. Even short periods of exposure to this type of weather can be dangerous. Winds also whipping in North Dakota, where it's expected to be negative 20 degrees. Across the nation, airlines canceling thousands of flights because of the deep freeze. They're putting the de-icer on, and the de-icer froze on the plane. And for Amtrak customers, all Chicago trains suspended. The flames on these tracks, intentional. Crews setting them on fire to keep commuter trains going. The weather so cold, the United States Postal Service suspending deliveries in multiple states across the country. Jeez. All right, we let Ryan Young go inside because That's we care cool. about him. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan, for that. Our meteorologist, Jennifer Gray, is tracking the polar vortex. Wow, how long uh, is the Midwest in, in store for this? Well, temperatures will finally rebound. I say rebound, get above zero by tomorrow afternoon. But uh, it's going to be cold all the way through much of the weekend. We really start to warm up by the time we get into Sunday and Monday. But until then, it is going to be bitterly cold across this area. 51 below zero is what it feels like in Chicago right now. Minneapolis feeling like 50 below. International Falls 54. Even Indianapolis feeling like 34 below zero. And then as we go through the day today, temperatures are really not not going to warm up. We stay well below zero as far as that feels like temperature. The wind chill, 40 below in Chicago by this afternoon. Marquette, 24 below. Cleveland, 25 below by 5 p.m. And then tomorrow morning, we are still in the same boat with temperatures well, well uh, below below zero, not to mention below freezing. By the time we get into Thursday afternoon, New York City, though, only feeling like two degrees by tomorrow morning uh, will definitely feel below zero as well. So it does spread into the east, and this is very far reaching. So we can get frostbite setting in in only 10 minutes with the wind chill 30 below, 50 below. It only takes five minutes, guys, for that exposed skin uh, to to get frostbite. Goodness gracious. Oh I, when I went to the North Pole, that's what the temperature was. Was there. it really? Yeah, it was minus 50 or something. Wow. So now oh it's gosh. happening on the streets of Chicago. That's wow. incredible. Yeah. Jennifer Gray, thanks very much. Right now, the U.S. welcomes China's top trade negotiator for high stakes talks, mm -hmm. but will new charges against China's tech giant Huawei backfire on those negotiations? And the other major talks today Congress working to avert another government shutdown. How will this time be different? We're talking to one of the lawmakers who will be in that meeting. Plus, Howard Schultz facing intense Democratic backlash over his potential 2020 run. I sat down with him and asked what he has to say to all of those critics. People are, are worried, and I understand that, that potentially this could end up re-electing Donald Trump. I don't believe that. This is CNN Breaking News. Right now, top negotiators for both the U.S. and China are beginning a critical round of high-level trade talks in Washington. But those talks are difficult, and the clock is ticking. Only 31 days until President Trump imposes 25 percent tariffs, new tariffs, on $200 billion worth of Chinese goods. This just moments ago yep. in those discussions. Yep, you have the Treasury Secretary there uh, also next to him. You have Larry Kudlow, et cetera. Uh, Will Barras right there, the Commerce Secretary. And to make the talks even more complicated, the uncertainty of the fate of the tiny Chinese tech giant Huawei and its CFO Meng Wanzhou. The Trump administration is now charging the company with nearly two dozen crimes, including violating U.S. sanctions uh, with Iran and stealing trade secrets. Christy Romans, our chief business correspondent, is here, as well as Stephen Moore, the former Trump economic advisor and author of Trumponomics. Good morning to you both. Romans, I am, I'm super interested in your take on this because I think your read is that the administration has been sort of dialing back expectations here about 30 days out. 
You know, I would say they're they're carefully kind of underplaying expectations, and I'll give you a perfect example. The, the Commerce Secretary, Wilbur Ross, last week on CNBC very clearly said we are miles and miles away from a deal. Uh, with 31 days to go, that's quite a statement to make. He also made a point, and others publicly and privately have made this point, too. There are people on the negotiating team there for the Americans who don't believe the Chinese will keep their word on any mm. kind of deal. You heard Secretary Ross talk about compliance. They have to have an ironclad agreement that, that China does what it says it will do. And remember, we have a long list of demands here, the United States does, and uh, uh, it's going to hurt. I mean, those demands would hurt for China to implement. It has an economy that is directed by the state. It's, it's national security, economic security, and, and future strategy is all one big state-determined uh, goal, and the United States is basically saying, we don't want you to do it like that anymore. We want to be able to have, you know, American companies own themselves. We want to be able to have intellectual property protections. We want all these things that are just not in the Chinese playing book. So there's, yeah. there's a long road here. Mm. And there are reasonable demands. I mean, China imposes rules that we don't impose on them. But, but Steve, as Christine was saying, I, I've been told the same thing, that the administration officials worry that if China makes commitments, for instance, to buy more U.S. goods, they won't actually do it. If they make uh, regulatory commitments, they won't actually do it. Um, so how do you solve that problem at this point, particularly when you now have a senior Chinese technology executive who's, been, who, who's being extradited to the U.S.? And that is a central concern for the Chinese as well. Well, Jim, you set up the segment very well when you called these talks uh, critical. They are critical mm -hmm. and difficult, and they are difficult, too. And, uh, you know, we have seen more and more bad behavior, even recently, from China in terms of some of the... Um, uh, industrial espionage that's going on. This country has become a bad actor. Um, you know, I think that uh, I, I agree with everything Christine said, except for one thing, Christine, where you said, you know, that we're making these demands that are tough for, you know, might not be in China's interest. Actually, as I see it, you know, if, if China would lower their tariffs and, and play by the rules and open up their markets to more American goods, I think it would be a win-win for both countries. Of course, I don't think Beijing sees that no. it that way because they have a very mercantilist uh, system. I will say this, I think that the thing that makes these so critical is that, you know, this is the big enchilada when it comes to the economy and its performance over the next two years. Donald Trump will move forward with these tariffs of 25%. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in the, when does that start? Sometime in the spring. 31 if, days. If he, does, if he does not have that deal. Hold on. And that will hurt so, both of us. That will hurt so, both of us. Yes. Yeah. It'll hurt us too. Mm -hmm. Christine, yep, sure. I mean, just look at the numbers out of Caterpillar this week. The yep. worst performance for Caterpillar, a Dow component, a huge indicator mm -hmm. of the economy overall, right in the, the heartland of America. Yeah. Worst performance in a decade. Why? Because of China's lower demand. Yes, our economy is yeah. weaker, but the tariffs, the trade war is hurting. If he goes ahead with this, and doesn't been a, it just hurt U.S. companies more? There's been half a dozen other companies that have said the same thing. You know, slowing demand from China is a problem. The trade war is is also a problem. You know, I think what could happen here is you could have the Chinese step forward and say, we're going to buy a whole boatload, literally and figuratively, of mm -hmm. soybeans and tractors and chickens. And, yeah. and President Trump is just enamored with this idea that the, the deficit, the trade deficit, is a sign of losing, and he wants to narrow that deficit. So the Chinese could step forward and try to make some tweaks around the edges and some big purchases. But what Robert Lighthizer and what others in this administration want to see are structural changes. And I think you're going to hear a lot over the next couple of days about structural changes in the way China does business, not necessarily just big purchases of soybeans and tractors. You know, we'll Christine, uh, when uh, I, Stephen, I spoke... Just I just want to ask you on an important point here. The president okay. has, an, an, to, to the ire of senior Justice Department officials, in the past... Seeming, seemingly raising the idea of going soft on Huawei or even this extradition mm -hmm. as part of the talks, connecting it to the talks. From the president's Wait, I'm sorry, point going of view, soft. is that sorry. a bargaining chip? Is that, Say that again. is that a bargaining chip, though, from the president's going view, this prosecution? Going, going soft on what? I didn't quite hear you. On, on the extradition of Meng, the Huawei uh, chief oh, right. technology officer. Is, well, the, in the president's things, view, is that a bargaining chip in these talks? It, it might be. Um, Look, I think wow. that this is so critical to helping both our economies perform. I mean, people in, in the United States don't really quite, uh, the media hasn't really covered how damaging these tariffs at 10 percent have already been. I mean, they have warehouses, they have docks, they have factories full of, uh, you know, uh, pr products that they can't sell because of a 10 percent tariff. This would do significant yeah. damage if it went to 25 percent. It's almost a game of... 
It's to be clear, are you saying that the president know? would trade a, a Department of Justice prosecution against a, a what the U.S. sees as a I, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> national security threat? I, I, I really don't know the answer to that, but I do know this. I mean, look, the White House, when you were talking about, earlier about China not keeping its word and, and lying and cheating, mm -hmm. you know, this is the frustration when I've talked to some of those uh, officials that are in that room. Uh, this morning, they, this is their fundamental frustration, is that they feel like that they've got to deal with, with China, and then the next day they do Compliance. the exact opposite yeah. thing, which mm -hmm. means yeah. what Trump needs to have here is what Reagan used to talk about when he used to uh, you know, negotiate against the Soviets. Trust, but verify. Yeah. You've got to get verification that they're actually living by the deal. Right. Christine, Stephen, thanks mm -hmm. very much as always. Thank you. New talks. Same old problem. Yeah. How will this round of shutdown negotiations be different from the last one, which was, what, a few days ago? Yeah. We're going to talk to one of the lawmakers who is trying to hash out a deal. And we are moments away from the opening bell on Wall Street. The Dow set to jump there. Look at futures up almost 300 points. Investors watching two things today, of course, as we just mentioned, the trade talks between the U.S. and China and the Federal Reserve meeting on interest rates. Very soon, 17 bipartisan lawmakers will meet for the first time in hopes of negotiating a border security plan to avoid another shutdown. One of them, one of the members of that committee, Congressman David Price of the great state of North Carolina. Congressman Price, thanks for taking the time this morning. Thank you. Good to be with you. Let's get right, if we can, to, to the border uh, and to a barrier there or a wall, which is clearly the linchpin from the president's perspective of, of a budget deal. Several, several of your Democratic colleagues, Senator John Tester, Senator Bob Casey on our air yesterday, uh, Hakeem Dress Jeffries, have said they would vote in support of a barrier, money for a barrier fencing on the wall. Would you do the same? Well, a, a barrier, a fence in appropriate places is clearly uh, an ingredient in border security. Uh, mm -hmm. I was chairman of the Homeland Security Appropriations Committee some time ago when we, when we built almost 700 miles of uh, fence, or at least that's the total that we, we brought it to. And uh, so that, that is something we've uh, been uh, able and willing to support in the past. I'd say just very quickly, four things have changed since then, though. First of all, we do have that 650 plus miles of, of fence, even though the president still talks about open borders. Secondly, we uh, have a different migrant mix coming now from, um, from Central America with a lot of uh, children, families, people actually turning themselves in, so a barrier isn't relevant. Thirdly, we have pressing needs for border security that I think are much more important than a physical barrier now, especially the uh, need to have more personnel, more equipment at our, uh, at our ports of entry, which is where most of the illegal uh, uh, cargo comes in. And then fourthly, the president, um, there's just no escaping. The president has made this a very toxic debate yeah. with uh, just reprehensible policies regarding uh, deportations, regarding uh, family separations, regarding refugee, right. refusing refugees. And so there's no question that has made that this debate uh, more, more complicated. I'm, I'm curious if, if you're open to, to giving some money for more, because the president, what has also changed is the president has reduced, in effect, his demand. He says no longer a wall from sea to shining sea, but a barrier uh, for, for some hundreds of miles. Uh, that's a position you've supported. Would you vote for a deal that includes money for such a barrier? The, the president hasn't changed a thing. I mean, John Kelly said that from the very beginning. He's the one who coined the phrase, uh, sea to shining sea, a couple of years ago. No, the president is threatening a shutdown. That's what's uh, wrong with the president's position. He's saying that uh, he wants to take, uh, he, he's demanding a ransom here. And that's totally unacceptable. Totally well, would unacceptable. You, would you, and, is the Democratic Party, are you and your colleagues willing to, to, to see another shutdown and to stand firm and say, as Nancy Pelosi has said, no money whatsoever for a wall. We are uh, we we are prepared for a, a conference that uh, that discusses the full range of uh, not just border security and after all, border security is about a lot more than a wall or a physical barrier, mm -hmm. and homeland security is about more than border security. For example, we need polar icebreakers. We need lots of things. And I tell you, in that homeland security bill that we're conferencing. Any money you take for a physical barrier where, where the president has upped the ante here and demanded this money, it has to come away from things like icebreakers and customs uh, officers and, and these other things. So we have some tough decisions to make about how to do this within uh, some pretty tight budget constraints. Are you going to meet with the president? There are no plans to do that right now. 
Uh, I certainly hope the Republican conferees are meeting with the president because they have to have some assurance that uh, he trusts them to negotiate an agreement and is not going to blow it up at the end as he, as he has so often before. Let me ask you this. Uh, you, of course, come from North Carolina. There's a House race there that a federal judge has refused to certify because of credible allegations of election fraud. Uh, right. Do you believe that the only way forward is a new election uh, in that seat? I, um, from what I've seen so far, I think that election is hopelessly compromised and, 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 and that probably a new election will be required. But I'm not uh, prepared to say that definitively. We need to have uh, an investigation that uh, fully runs its course. We've had a an unrelated uh, problem with our state board of elections being duly constituted. That is now going to be remedied this week. We're going to have a new board of elections. They're going to pick up on this investigation. And our attitude here in the House, even though we have ultimate jurisdiction over who is seated, our attitude here is that the state board of elections needs to do its work and that an investigation uh, needs to run its course. Final question. Senator Kamala Harris uh, has ignited something of a firestorm in the Democratic Party by announcing <coughs> her support for Medicare for all. Do you support such a plan? And, and crucially, how would the Democratic Party suggest paying for it? Well, this, uh, this is, of course, becoming a, a litmus test that some people want to apply to, uh, to, to Ms. Harris and other, uh, other candidates. Uh, you know, the, the, the answer is that the Democratic Party and the leadership of this country, I think, needs to do uh, three things at once. We need to, first of all, prevent the sabotage of the Affordable Care Act. We need to make uh, some, uh, make sure that people with pre-existing conditions are covered and all the rest. We need to make sure the Trump administration doesn't sabotage it further. Secondly, we need to build on it. I'd like to see uh, a public option within the Affordable Care Act. I'd like to see Medicare buy-in. And then thirdly, we need to uh, think about ultimately what kind of uh, path we take to uh, universal coverage. Uh, you know, you got to do all three things at the same time. And, and I would hope our presidential candidates would, uh, would understand that. Congressman Price, thanks very much for joining us this morning. Thank you. All right, so you've probably heard by now, former Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz is mulling an independent run for the White House. You've probably also heard a lot of Democrats don't like that. But do you know where he actually stands on the most important issues? I asked him that's next. Welcome back. Former Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz facing Democratic backlash over his potential 2020 independent run. But before we get into all of that next hour, what would a Schultz run actually look like when it comes to policy from immigration to taxes to health care? This as he details his life's journey from child abuse, growing up in the projects of Brooklyn, to building Starbucks and becoming a billionaire. It's all in his new book, From the Ground Up. And here's what he told me. When did you stop being a Democrat? I, you know, I think I started, I think the party started losing me uh, when the party started shifting so far left to progressive policies that I know in my heart are as false and I, I, I say this with respect, but it's true. As false as President Trump telling the American people when he was running for president that the Mexicans were going to pay for the wall. So when was that? You're referring to Medicare for all, for example, right? Well, if you add up the three policies that seem to be the backbone of the current Democratic Party uh, in terms of the 2020 process, mm -hmm. it's free Medicare, free, med free health care for everybody, free free college degree and a, and a job for everybody. And that adds up to about $40 trillion in 10 years. Well, that's not going to happen on the foundation of a $21 trillion debt. So it's not true. I, I don't know Senator Harris, but just last night, she made a statement on your network that, and I'm paraphrasing, but she made a statement that in terms of, of free government paid health care, that if she was president, she would wipe out the entire insurance industry. Now, to she, me... She is supportive of Medicare for all and is supportive of that eliminating private insurance in this country. Eliminating. So you know what that means? What do you think of that? Well, it, that's a very cavalier statement. What it means is that millions of people who work in the insurance industry, as well as the adjacency, are going to lose their jobs. Why do you think Medicare for all, in your words, is not American? It's, it's not that it's not American. It's unaffordable. So let me... Let me be very clear. 
because you called it non-American. Healthcare, healthcare earlier. has been central to my entire life. We've just talked about that. The first company in America to provide comprehensive health insurance to part-time people. I, I know a lot about this issue. It's deeply in my heart. Now, what I believe is that every American has the right to affordable health care as a statement. I also believe that the Affordable Care Act under President Obama was the right thing to do to provide over 30 million people who didn't, did not have insurance to get insurance. But now that we look back on it, the premiums have skyrocketed and we need to go back to the Affordable Care Act refine it and fix it. So the price tag on it, uh, whether you look at the Urban Institute numbers or the Mercatus yeah. numbers, are $32 trillion for Medicare for All over a decade. But yeah. Senator Sanders says of his plan, yes, you pay more in taxes for it. The health care savings that Americans aren't spending to private insurers is $2 trillion. You say. Uh, it's, it, it's, this is not true. Immigration. I'm interested in what you would do and what you would propose as president for the roughly 11 million undocumented yeah. immigrants currently in this yeah. country, not just the dreamers. Yeah. What would you do? First off, I agree with the Republicans completely that we need strict, stiff border security. But not, but a not, wall. not with a wall, which is insanity. So I agree. We, I also agree with the Republicans, not the Democrats, that ICE has a major role to play in this. But Republicans want to strip mothers from babies and put kids in internment camps. I don't agree with that. Path to citizenship for those 11 million? Well, let me get to the dreamers first. Is we're a country of immigrants. We're a country based on humanity and fairness. I think it's un-American for the dreamers not to have a pathway to citizenship, and they should be given that. With regard to the 11 million people who are un unauthorized, let them get in line pay taxes, pay a fee, and over time, give them the opportunity to become Americans. But they remain under a Schultz presidency, if you had your druthers, those 11 million undocumented immigrants would remain in this country on a path to citizenship? Correct. You would not send them to their home country? No, I would not. Income inequality. Yes. Story of your life, right? Yes. There are, uh, you've already condemned the, the Trump tax cut, right? Yes. The corporate tax yeah, cut. Yeah, I was wrong. There are a few different proposals out there now from progressive liberal Democrats on how to tackle this. So let, let's take two of them, okay? First, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, a congresswoman from Queens, supports a 70% marginal tax rate on the rich. Your eyebrows go up when I say that. That is on their you know, 10 millionth dollar and above. As you know, we saw a 90% marginal tax rate under a Republican, President yeah. Eisenhower. Yeah. What do you think of that? Well, let's go back to the idea that if I ran for president as an independent, I'm going to steal Democratic votes away from President Trump. Let's go a different way. If the Democrats are proposing anything close to a 70 percent level of income tax, how many core Democrats are going to be supportive of a move towards socialism? Not very many. President Trump will get reelected. How would your plan then reduce the income gap from what it is today, widening every year? If it's, you know, is it raising corporate taxes immensely? I think the 21% tax rate was wrong. I would not be supportive of that if I was president. But would you raise corporate taxes? Uh, I would not be supportive of 21%. That should give you some idea as to what I would do. Elizabeth Warren's proposal is a wealth tax. Oh, God. It's an additional 2% yeah. tax on Americans whose net worth, this isn't just an income tax, yeah, I know, actually, I know. it's an asset tax. Yeah. What do you think of that? Is over $50 million. <laughs> yeah. Good idea? Uh, well, f first of all, it's an idea that has no merit. It, 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 she knows that there's no way this could come to pass. This, these are just false campaign promises to make noise. And again, it's punitive. No, I don't agree with that. By the way, Elizabeth Warren is now fundraising off of Schultz's opposition to her plan. Next hour, Schultz will respond to the backlash she's facing from the Democratic Party. You can hear our full interview uh, an hour long with Howard.